Hare Krishna. Uh, is there anyone else who wants um, the material going to be shared by Maharaj? Like some of us wrote uh, by email. Yeah. Maharaj compiled some material for the seminar. If you provide him your email address, he can email it to you. But since you Krishna, Krishna, Hare.
Hare Krishna. Sorry for the delay. Man proposes, God disposes. Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya, Bhutale Srimakte Bhaktivedanta Swami Iti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine, Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatyare Satarine, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sya Dvaita Gadar Har Sivasadi Gor Bhakta Rindam Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this is a continuation of a very important and most uh, extensive subject. It's important because it, everything we do centers around this basic relationship between guru and disciple. And it's, it's, it's uh, complex because there's endless amounts of aspects to it. And Within our ISKCON society, the dynamics have been somewhat, what we say, extended beyond the normal understanding of guru-disciple relationship because of the worldwide movement we have. <laughs> and the principle generally was spiritual master, teacher, guru was someone who was very much a part of one's life on a personal level, always available within the confines of one's area of livelihood, resident. But, and that is the traditional way. Sometimes the guru, of course, would travel occasionally. But, but now we have, what I say, a very dynamic uh, arrangement where the guru not only does the work of a spiritual master but has other responsibilities within the complexity of the ISKCON society along with um, the you know, lack of you know contact with the disciple because of such responsibilities <laughs> So sometimes we have to redefine or readdress the, the relationship in terms of the different dynamics. And um, therefore sometimes we find that uh, it's not so clear what <clears throat> our relation is or how to access that relation. Uh, we spoke about practically every major subject that comes under the hitting. We talked about what is guru, different types of spiritual masters, how the guru is one, how the guru is different, how the guru is non-different from the Lord, how the guru is at the same time one and different from the Lord. Uh, we spoke about uh, the qualifications of a spiritual teacher, spiritual master, we spoke about some of the disqualifications or what appears to be uh, qualifications but are not. We also spoke about disciples, qualifications, and this morning's class was disqualifications of a disciple. 
So it's fundamental on everything we do, but we should understand what really is the relationship. And this is where a lot of what we say persons who come into our movement have a different understanding as time goes by is what is that relationship. <clears throat> that relationship is really based on our relationship with Krishna. Uh, as we have an eternal loving relationship with Krishna, but it's inaccessible in this material world due to our, what we say, connection with the material energy. And therefore, Krishna is very difficult to reach. And he can be reached only according to how he explains he can be reached. <laughs> of course, we may reach him in different ways, but what is the essence of our relationship with Krishna is defined in Shastras in so many ways. The essence is that that relationship with Krishna is never lost. It's only forgotten. <laughs> uh, but we don't remember that. It's like when you go to sleep you forget your waking existence. And when you wake up a lot of times you forget what you dreamt about. <laughs> so when we leave the confines of the presence of our of Krishna, we come into this material world, and God seems to be an idea at best, or maybe a, a conception, maybe. But to act, uh, but actually, God is the closest thing that we can come to, with, because. In the tattva of spirituality, which means the philosophical principles that make up existence, there's nothing outside of God. We create inside and outside by our own consciousness, but everything is within God and nothing is outside of God. We are within God and we are at the same time outside of God simultaneously. Outside, because we are not feeling his presence all the time, and inside is because everything that is, is in existence is, is con created and controlled by him perfectly and completely. So it's a most amazing thing that the closest thing to us and the most hardest thing to access at the same time. It's almost like you have a great treasure in the middle of your house, but you just don't know where it is. <laughs> and you're looking all over for it. But the thing is, it's in your pocket, and that's the place you forget to look. <laughs> because you're looking in the areas outside of yourself. But God is everything, and everything is within God. Krishna says, uh, says that in the Bhagavad Gita. Maya idam tadam tagat avyakti murtane matstani sarvabhutani nateshu vavastita. Everything is in me, but I am not within everything at the same time. But he is. Why does he say that? He says something that's not correct. <laughs> Because people think that every he, he just, he's destroying a certain philosophical principle that is not correct. That everything is God. Everything is God, but at the same time, not God. Of course, that doesn't make any sense. How can something be something be the same and different at the same time? Well, that's the word is achintya. Achintya means that which cannot be conceived of or inconceivable. So spiritual 
philosophical principles are inconceivable by us. The mind, the senses, intelligence, and we might even go as far as to say the imagination. The imagination can go beyond the intelligence, but still can't reach to the level of the absolute. Because no one can even imagine God. It's just like even when we hear about God, we're not sure if that's correct. <laughs> because all we can do is accept what is given to us like that. How? But everything that moves or doesn't move is his energy like that. And we are also his energy, just like this body we have. It's a combination of eight elements. Krishna says in the Gita, Bhumir Apanalobayu Kamana Buri Evacha Ahankar Ityame Binakriti Astada Earth, water, fire, air, mind, intelligence, the false ego make up my separated. So he's talking about the material energy simply is comprised of these eight energies, that's all. There's nothing outside of the, these eight energies that in the, is in the creation. But the combination of these things make up the different forms of existence in the material world. So everything you see, and the things you don't even see, because Krishna mentions mind, intelligence, and ego, false ego. You can't see those, but they're also part of the material created existence. So, but of the created existence that we can perceive through our senses, senses and mind, is what makes up our physical gross body. And what we can't perceive, it makes up our subtle, invisible body, like that. So, even the body we have is made up of these eight elements. So those eight elements come from Krishna. <laughs> or he is the creator of the elements. And then, of course, under the, his direction, those elements are assembled in different forms, and that is what is called creation. The Lord glances over the aggregate of material energy and he by his glance he puts it into motion like that so his glance is the fiery energy known as Shiva so when Shiva is is projected into the material energy he's also called the father of all living entities that glance is the glance of Mahavishnu which is the Shiva aspect and then he glances upon the external energy and that moves these elements. And when they move, the most intelligent person within existence, Lord Brahma, comes and formulates everything and there you have the created material existence. So when you look at it, therefore everything, both animate, inanimate, is actually the energy of the Lord and it's activated and what we say uh, sustained by the Lord and ultimately is also destroyed by the Lord. So everything in one sense and is God, but at the same time everything is not God. The energy and the energetic are the same. So this is like the sun and the sunshine. The sunshine is the energy of the sun. It's also sometimes called the sun. Although it's the light of the sun, it's not the sun itself. So that energy is not separate from the sun. There's no question of the sun energy being separated from the sun, but the sun energy is not the sun. But the sun energy is also the sun. So using that example, we get a little bit of understanding of how existence manifests itself. Creation exists like that. But beyond... All this creative manifestations, there's a realm of existence that is not created and not destroyed. It exists in its own eternal self-effulgent aspect of its own self. 
and that is called the spiritual energy, which is not what we say doesn't have any of the characteristics of the material energy. That is, it doesn't, it's not created, it doesn't change, it's not destroyed, it is not, it needs nothing else within itself to exist. Just like in the material energy, there has to be a combination of the different energies in order for things to happen. But in the spiritual energy, it's self-effulgent all by itself. That realm of existence is of the same nature of our identity. So we belong to that spiritual energy, but we have no recollection of that spiritual energy. All we can, we perceive mostly the material energy and how it works, interacts. Even that is, our, is limited in our own experience. So, to access God, what to speak of accessing His energies, is, is practically impossible. <laughs> it's not practically, it is. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Vedaham samatityani uh, vartmanane nani charjunya bhavishyami chibutani mam tu vedanarakaschina. He says, I know everything in the past. I know everything that's happening in the present. I know thing, all things that y are yet to come. I also know all living entity. And then he ends by saying, but me, no one knows. <laughs> so God, he even says it himself, nobody knows me. <laughs> but the goal of our existence is to know God. So how can we do that? By reading books, by philosophizing, by different you know means that we create within this realm of you know interaction. No, there's only one way you can know God, and that's through God's direction, and therefore that is called the spiritual master. <laughs> So the spiritual master is the manifestation of God's mercy to know God through his own, what we say, personal example like that. So as we learn about God, we have to learn that from the spiritual master. There's no other way. <clears throat> Krishna mentions that many times. <clears throat> you have to take shelter of my representative. So what is that shelter? <clears throat> There's a qualitative consciousness that is necessary to access the shelter of the Lord through the spiritual master. One cannot simply remain the way they are and still understand God. There has to be a transformation of consciousness, which will also, what we say, cause a transformation of lifestyle. Because as our consciousness cha changes, our values also change. And as our values change, our activities change. And as our activities change, everything changes. <laughs> like that. So it begins with changing consciousness. <clears throat> so what is our present consciousness? Our present consciousness is that we are the center. <clears throat> and we see the world in relationship to ourself. That is a wrong conception. <laughs> because of that wrong conception, everything we do is wrong. Everything we do is wrong because we see the world according to our own consciousness. Therefore, we have to see the world and we see ourselves according to the way God sees us. <laughs> and because his vision is perfect. So the spiritual master teaches us how to see everything through spiritual vision. Or correct vision, we might say. So therefore, in order to access that knowledge, 
one has to perform the activities of a disciple. So being a disciple is not a small thing. <laughs> and that's why very few people take to spiritual life. Because they're not willing to make changes in their life. <clears throat> they, most people think spiritual life is another form of material enjoyment. Where I can enjoy in a better way. <laughs> There is the element of enjoyment, which is, which is paramount in spiritual practice, but it doesn't come by way of, you know, our present perception of what enjoyment is. It comes by way of God's perception of how enjoyment is accessed. So in order to access that element of supreme happiness and enjoyment, one has to connect with the path or the consciousness that is conducive to that enjoyment, which is God's way for us. And that's the message of the spiritual master. So what, God, what the spiritual master says is like what God says. Now that's a strong statement. People will take exception with that. How is a mortal person able to somehow or other be the person that speaks on behalf of God. Well, that ability, or that me, we might say that empowerment is coming from the Lord himself. <clears throat> so as the Lord empowers someone to speak on his behalf, that person can do it. Because as we mentioned before, God is within everything and everything is within God. So God is not, he is mo the most prominent thing in all, but his existence is not perceived through sense, you know, perception. His existence is perceived through a medium of activities which changes our consciousness and brings our consciousness to the realm of understanding our relationship with Him and with everything else simultaneously. Because when you understand your relationship with God, you can understand your relationship with everything. Now, if you try to understand your relationship with everything without understanding your relationship with God, which people do, you will never understand your relationship with everything. Because everything is under the control, motivated, controlled, and originated within God. So to leave out the source and to try to deal with the energy separate is what is called a hard struggle for existence. <laughs> so that hard struggle ends when we take shelter of his representative. And when we take shelter of his representative, we receive unlimited transcendental knowledge, which changes our consciousness and awakens our consciousness to the presence of God in all aspects of existence. So therefore, life itself requires one to take shelter, in order to take shelter of God, to take shelter of God's representative. Now, shelter is an interesting word. It means that when you take shelter of God's representative, you are also taking shelter of God. But what it means is that you can get everything you need in one place. You can get everything you need in one place, or everything you require in one place, as opposed to everything you want that's different. And as you take shelter of God, you real you recognize the spiritual master, you recognize your real needs. And you can as you recognize your real needs, they are automatically fulfilled in one aspect of activity, and that is service to God through service to the spiritual master. Because you have to understand one thing. 
you are never separated from God, but you think you are. <laughs> That's the problem. We think we're separated from God. We feel separated from God. God seems to be so far removed from our existence. But that is called illusion. So to, to destroy the illusion or to get to the reality, the spiritual master is the, the medium. He's like the doctor that cures the disease. But the, the patient has to be willing to submit themselves to the doctor's prescription. Otherwise, the medicine doesn't take effect fully. If we keep our own understanding of what spiritual life is like, we will always be baffled in our attempts to practice spiritual life. Therefore, that's why when Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, he wound up everything after speaking practically 700 and no, 600 and maybe 90 verses, 688 verses. He finally, after he gave everything in terms of what how this world works, who he is, who we are, what is the basis of activities, the different ways to practice spiritual life. After he gave all this information, he just simply summed it up in one thing. Just, just surrender to me, that's all. <laughs> that's all. He ended it by saying, give up your own ideas on how you can benefit your own self and surrender. You've been trying for so many lifetimes and you're not getting anywhere. Why don't you just give it up? <laughs> so he gets a little strong at the end. <laughs> After giving us all the knowledge and explaining what is the, the results of surrender, finally he says, Sarva Dharma Pradiksuja. What it, and that verse is, is very important in terms of its meaning. Surrender is more than submission. It is submission, but it's more in the sense that Krishna is saying, whatever other ways you think are beneficial for you, forget it. <laughs> and do it my way. <laughs> That's what he's basically saying in that verse, 1866. And that's explained in the Narada Bhakti Sutras in one of the verses, where that verse is taken apart piece by piece and explained in very wonderful detail. Do we have chairs? Do we have chairs for our guests? Get some chairs for everyone. And it's, it's taken apart piece by piece and finally... You know, ultimately it is, okay, here it is. So, I'll tell you a little story. Because you can't figure out spiritual life. The more you try to figure it out, the more confused you get. <laughs> I'll give you an example of a story. It's an interesting story. It shows how we may think things work, but how things really don't work. <laughs> Would you like to hear the story? You sure? Yes. Uh, okay. There was this one simple man, and he was the cleaner in, the, in one temple. A very prominent temple in India. And he would clean, keep the place king. He was the custodian, like that. And he did this job year after year, day after day. And he was always seeing the deity. And he was always seeing people coming in and out of the temple. So, in his own imaginative, imaginative mind, he thought, I wonder what people are asking the Lord I wonder what, it, what they're saying to the Lord. So many people come and they offer prayers. I just wonder what it's like. So that night he fell asleep. And in the, in the dream, the Lord appeared to him and says, You want to be me? 
You can be me for one day. Just so you can understand what's going on. You can be the deity. I'll give you that position for one day. But there is one condition. You don't speak. <laughs> and he agreed. Now, that condition wasn't so easy to follow. <laughs> so he's up there, and now he's the deity. So one man comes along, and he's very rich, and he takes out his wallet, and he gives a nice donation to the Lord, and he's praying to the Lord in different ways. Obviously, he wants to increase his wealth. People come to God, they give a dollar, and they ask for how much? More? <laughs> Reminds me of one story where one man said to his friend, I'm going to pray to the Lord for a million dollars. And if I get a million, I'll give half to him. So he went to the Lord and he prayed and prayed and he got a half a million dollars. And then he didn't give anything to the Lord. So his friend said, well, you're going to, said you were going to give him half. He said, I prayed for a million and I got a half. That means he already took his half. Mm -hmm. So that's how people think. <laughs> so anyway, he this this simple man, he's the deity. This rich man comes up, he offers a nice donation, he's praying for more wealth. So in his prayer and in his hurriedness, he forgets his wallet, right by the deity. So a poor man follows, and he's saying, My dear Lord, I can hardly eat from day to day. My family is starving. I'm struggling so much. Please provide something for our family. And then after he makes a very sincere and very humble prayer to the Lord, he looks down and sees this wallet. And he's saying, oh, thank you, Lord. That was fast. <laughs> so he takes the wallet. Now, a third man comes in and says, my dear Lord, I'm a sailor. I'm going on a very dangerous sea voyage beginning tomorrow. Please protect me. Please, you know, preserve my life. Help me out. So while he's praying, the rich man comes back and he's looking for his wallet. And he can't find it. And then he sees the sailor there and he says, oh, you, might, you took my wallet. And the sailor says, what are you talking about? He says, you're the only person who came since I left, and then you must have taken it. And so he's arguing with the sailor, and finally the rich man gets really angry and starts to call the police, and they come. Now, he's the deity, and he's not allowed to say anything, right? He sees the whole thing. He knows the sailor didn't do it. So he can't restrain himself anymore. So he speaks, and he says, no, this man didn't do it. He's innocent. God speaking. Oh, the rich man, he bows down, the police, everybody bows down. Oh, oh the rich man gets up, he apologizes to the sailor. I'm sorry I accused you. Oh, God said you didn't do it. Oh. And everything was nice, and he left. So that night the Lord appears to him. He said, I told you to keep quiet. Well, why'd you speak? That rich man, he's so greedy. He always comes to me asking me for money. He wants more. And so I caused him to lose his wallet. And this other poor man, he's, he's my devotee. He's struggling so hard. I, I caused him to find the wallet. And this sailor... He was going to go on that dangerous sea voyage, and I arranged for him to get blamed so he could get arrested and go to jail because he's going to die if he goes on the sea voyage. So can we really figure out how God works? No. <laughs> so what apparently seems to be what we like and what we don't like is not always 
It is apparent. They say what's happening may be just the opposite of what you think is happening. Therefore, again, we come back to the spiritual master. Therefore, the spiritual master clarifies everything and helps us understand that our activities in this world are not the, exactly the way we see them, nor are they beneficial for us. Therefore, one who takes spirit, shelter of the spiritual master gets what is called transcendental knowledge. And we'll talk about this tonight in this prayer, Guru Vandanam prayer, which is the subject matter for tonight's lecture. And in that prayer, there's one line Divya Gyan Ridde Prakasita. You know that line? Right? Divya Gyan Ridde Prakasita. Chakshudan Diloye Janme Janme Prabhuse. Divya Gyan Ridde. And what does that line mean? That the spiritual master infuses the sincere and eager disciple with transcendental knowledge. Eagerness, sincerity, is what we say preliminary qualifications for transcendental knowledge. But submission to the instructions of the spiritual master allows for that knowledge to manifest within the heart. Many people read books. Many people hear transcendental knowledge. But how deep does it go? How much does it resonate? And how much are they actually able to act on it is only when one, one accepts the spiritual master's teachings as the teachings of God, non-different. Then when we have that faith, then that awakens within us the essence of the knowledge we hear. Because knowledge is more than just words. It's an awakening of understanding. It brings about transcendental realization, or brings about knowledge, transcendental knowledge. It's compared to the sun. There's one beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Just like when the sun lights up everything, by its presence in the daytime, transcendental knowledge lights up everything within our life. It com makes everything completely clear. So that transcendental knowledge cannot be a had by reading books. It has to be infused within you by the presence of the spiritual master who blesses you with transcendental knowledge when you are when you please him through your execution of devotional service like that. So that's the process. So therefore, without the presence of the spiritual master in our life, we simply exist on the plane of mental speculation. Therefore, many persons who come to Krishna consciousness leave because they're not ready to surrender. That's the problem. We come... And Krishna says why people come to spiritual life. Four kinds of people come to spiritual life. Those who are suffering materially, the distressed. Those who are looking for some economic gain, something material. through spirit. God owns everything. Therefore, if I just go to God, he can give me some of it. <laughs> God owns everything, therefore if I go to God, he can give me some of it, he'll share it with me. And my, my, uh, my uh, way to get it is through prayer. And the third one is those who are curious. What is spiritual life? What is it all about? And the last one, and the best, is those who are looking for the absolute truth. Those who are seeking God as the goal of life. So four kinds of people come to spiritual life, but the first two come for material reasons. 
The third one comes from a quasi-spiritual reason, and the last comes for the best reason. So generally, we say that when people come to spiritual life, when they get their material desires satisfied, or when they get some relief from material distress, then they go back to the material world again. <laughs> because they've achieved their goal. <clears throat> but the real goal is to understand what is our existence, what is God, and how to relate to God in the most perfect and, and when we say most perfect way. And that only can be accessed with the presence of the spiritual master in our life. Therefore, a spiritual master is uh, what we say the merciful manifestation of God because he's giving these things freely to each and every one of us. Otherwise, we can't access it ourselves. There's no way. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Karunya, uh, Kar Parma Karuna. Uh, Maharaj, I'm asking the same question which I asked yesterday. Uh, the Uttamadikari or the highly elevated spiritual master can infuse bhakti by seeing or talking. Can you? You gave me the explanation yesterday. But can he's you empower, this? He's empowered to do that. So how how it is possible? Just by seeing you, he just infuses the bhakti. I'm sorry. When the wood when the wood is wet, the wood will catch fire. And when the wood is wet, the wood will not catch fire. When the wood is dry, it lights. So, if the wood is in presence of fire, it doesn't immediately burn if it's wet. Only when the wood dries out will, it, uh, will the fire begin. Right? So, sadhu sangha, sadhu sangha, sarva sastri hoy, labha mata, sadhu sangha, sarva siddhi hoy. So what does that mean? That we continue to take association with sadhus until our consciousness reaches that stage of receptivity. Then immediately knowledge enters within us as a feature of our existence and not something on the intellectual level. In other words, you get enlightened when you are ready. So how do you get ready? You continue to associate and you continue to hear and you continue to serve. And you're in that part, you're drying out the wood. <laughs> and at one time, it'll catch. Give you an example. Maybe all of you have had this experience. We have heard how many times we are not this body, right? We hear it all the time. Now, how many of you actually realize it? Realization is different than hearing it. Realization means it goes to the heart and you say, yes, it's true. So you hear it how many times? But when you hear it that one time and it goes to the heart, all of a sudden, all the results of hearing that all those previous times are culminated in that one experience. <laughs> so that's why repetition of transcendental knowledge is the feature of disseminating this knowledge. We say it over and over and again until you get it. <laughs> but you won't get it until you're ready to get it. <laughs> and you have to be you have to prepare yourself to get ready. So even though you're not getting it, still, as you keep hearing it, you're becoming more and more qualified to receive it. And then someday, it'll come as a realization. Just like we say, the holy name is Krishna. So there's no difference. And so what is that verse? Um, all the energies of the supreme absolute truth are found in that word Krishna. All of existence is in that word Krishna. 
all of all of everything is in that word Krishna. Krishna. That word Krishna is the full manifestation of the Godhead complete. Now you might say, how is that possible? On the intellectual level, you can't figure it out. But through the experience of chanting, and as you purify your consciousness, that knowledge is revealed to you as an experience, not as something intellectual. So that's how spiritual life works. Spiritual life is not a spectator sport. you got to dive into it <laughs> in order to taste it. Philosophy is a way to... The way to the truth, but philosophy is not an end in itself. The philosophy points the way, but the way is surrender to the Lord. So, to have a causeless mercy, we have to work for that, or causeless mercy comes automatically? It's causeless because it's you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is be in the position to receive it. Do we have to work for that? You have to change your way of thinking. In other words, you have to make your consciousness receptive to the knowledge. And then understand it and practice it. It takes time. Just like if you want to plant a tree, you put the seed in the ground. You don't expect the tree to happen as soon as you put the seed in the ground. You have to water the seed, cultivate the ground, protect it from whatever dangers it may possibly encounter. So it takes time. So our our the analogy is that our our love of God is like a full blown plant that has flowers and, and beautiful leaves on it. But it starts with a simple seed. And that seed is planted by the spiritual master. You can't plant it yourself. Because he knows where to plant it. <laughs> and how to plant it like that. So you understand that point? All you have to do is be submissive to what is being offered. You use your intelligence to surrender, not your intelligence not to surrender. <laughs> when all your your intelligence should be directed in a way